fasting without calorie restriction and calorie restriction with fasting extend lifespan. And that's what we'll see here. These data are from a recently published study. And if you want to read the study yourself, it'll be in the video's description. So on the y-axis, we've got the survival probability, how many mice had died and how many mice were alive. And on the x-axis, we've got age in months. So how long did the mice live? And then the intervention was started at six months. So starting at six months of age, mice were randomly assigned to one of five groups as shown there. And note that 192 mice were used for each group so that the total study included 960 mice. And as just as a quick aside, if you see lifespan studies that used eight mice or rats per group, that pales in comparison to a study like this, which used 192 mice per group, 960 in total. All right, so let's take a deeper dive into each of these five groups. So ad lib is ad libitum. That means the mice could eat as much as they wanted whenever they wanted. And we can see that there are gray squares for all of the days. So they could eat whatever they want, as much as they wanted, whenever they wanted. And then one day of fasting, we can see that that was for half the day on Wednesday and half the day on Thursday. So they fasted for one day per week. Similarly, the 2D is two days of fasting. So midday Wednesday through midday Friday. And then there was a 20% calorie restricted group. So you can see that their squares, their orange squares, are 20% smaller relative to ad lib. And they ate like that from Monday through Thursday. On Friday, they got their weekend food. So generally lab techs don't work on weekends, so they gave them three days of food in one day. So the mice in the 20% CR group then ate all of their food on Friday and Saturday and had no food left on Sunday. So they fasted for one day a week. So 20% CR with one day of fasting. And then the 40% group, similarly, they had much smaller food, obviously 40% relative to ad lib, Monday through Thursday. And then for their weekend food, they too received three days worth of food on Friday, but they ate all of their food on Friday and then nothing on the remaining two days. So what was the impact on lifespan? So for that, we put up a black line at 0.5 uh, survival. That's the time when half the colony has died and half is still alive. That's median survival, 50% survival. And when compared with the ad lib group, we can see that there are two lines that basically overlap in terms of an increased median lifespan the one day and two days of fasting. So let's take a deeper dive into food intake for those groups, which is shown here. So when comparing the one day of fasting to ad lib, we can see that they actually ended up eating close to significantly more food relative to ad lib, 2.5% more relative to the group that could eat as much as they wanted whenever they wanted. And you can see that the p-value is 0.06. So in other words, the group that fasted for one day per week ate 2.5% more food than ad lib, and that amount of food was very close to significantly higher than the ad lib group. Nonetheless, that one day of fasting without calorie restriction was sufficient to extend median lifespan for the one day of fasting group. On the other hand, the group that had two days of a fast ended up calorie restricted. So they ate 11.5% less food than the ad lib group. But interestingly, the magnitude of the lifespan extension was the same as the group that didn't CR, but had one day of fasting. So it suggests that there's a window of not having to be CR where we can potentially get an increased, at least median lifespan. All right, so the group that was 20% CR had a further rightward shift, a further increase for median lifespan relative to ad lib. And for that group, when quantifying actual food intake, it ended up being 27.1% CR, not 20%. But the largest increase in lifespan, median lifespan, when comparing all of these groups, as you can see, is that red line. That's the 40% CR group that saw a 36% increase in median lifespan. And in terms of actual food consumed, it then ended up being about 44% less relative to ad lib. But where this story gets more interesting is that the 40% CR group ended up resisting the age-related decline for wheel running. In other words, this just wasn't a study of mice in a cage given less food or more food or fasting or not fasting. They all had access to running wheels. And the group that was 40% CR, as we'll see, ended up resisting that age-related wheel running decline. So on the y-axis, we've got wheel running in kilometers per day and then plotted against age in months. So prior to the study onset at five months of age, we can see that all of the five groups ran a similar amount in their wheels at, at five months of age. 
But then during aging, we can see that all of the groups, except for one, ran less on the wheel every day. And that one group that didn't run less over time was that 40% CR group. So not only did the 40% CR group have the longest lifespan, they were also the most physically active for the duration of their lifespan. So where the story gets even more interesting, and I, mean, I know I've said that a few times already, but this paper is a goldmine of information, is that there was lifespan variability between the groups. So what does that mean? So on the left, we've got our five groups, and then starting with median lifespan for the uh, longest lived group, the 40% CR group at 36 months, that was their median lifespan, so I put a green line there. We can see that to the right of that, uh, having mice live longer than 36 months wasn't exclusive to the longest lived mice, so the 40% CR group. You can see that for all of the other groups, there were mice that lived longer than 36 months, even in the ad lib group, in the ad lib group, which then led the authors to ask what might contribute to a longer lifespan independent of group assignment. So whether the mice were CR or not, what factors may be involved in extending lifespan or extending at least median lifespan? And that's what we'll see here. So we've got various biomarkers, some of them blood-based, others body composition-based, like percent fat. And that's plotted on the y-axis. This is in a log scale. So the negative log p, uh, log 10p, that's log scale. And that's plotted against the adjusted lifespan correlation. So what that means is if the biomarker is to the right of zero, higher levels of the biomarker are significantly associated or correlated with a longer lifespan. And if the biomarker is to the left of zero, higher levels of the biomarker are significantly correlated with a shorter lifespan. So in terms of one of the biomarkers that's most strongly correlated with a longer lifespan, that's lymphocyte levels when the mice were 16 months old. In other words, relatively higher levels of lymphocytes at 16 months old for the mice, regardless of which, which group they, they, that they were in, which, that they came from, was significantly correlated with a longer lifespan. On the other hand, the biomarker that was most strongly correlated with a shorter lifespan was an RDW when the mice were 10 months of age. And as a quick aside, the RDW is the red blood cell distribution width. That's a measure of the standard deviation of whether your red blood cells are all one volume, all essentially the same size, or do you have a mix of very small and large red blood cells? So the RDW is a measure of that variability in red blood cell volume slash size. So having a higher RDW when the mice were 10 months of age, again, independent of which group they came from, whether it's 40% CR or ad lib, was significantly correlated with a shorter lifespan. But these data are in mice. So what does this have to do with people? So interestingly, the story, and I know I said that that's not the fourth time, the story is similar in people. So higher lymphocytes are associated with a reduced risk of death for all causes, ACM risk. And that's what we'll see here. So on the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality risk, risk of death for all causes, plotted against lymphocyte counts. And what we can see is that the lowest risk of death for all causes is when lymphocytes are 2 times 10 to the 9th per liter, or 2,000 cells per microliter. And that 2,000 number is important because lymphocytes around 2,000 are more likely to be found in youth, and lymphocytes decline during aging. And I covered all of these data in an earlier video. If you missed it, it'll be in the right corner. Now, the importance of the age-related decline for lymphocytes is that relatively lower levels are associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, as shown by the red lines. So these data agree with the data in mice where relatively higher levels of lymphocytes were associated with a longer lifespan or correlated with a longer lifespan. Similarly, a high RDW is associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk also in people, which is what we'll see here. And on the y-axis, we've got the RDW value in percentage, and that's plotted against all-cause mortality risk. In terms of what's significant, we put up a red line at a hazard ratio of 1. When the data is completely to the right of that hazard ratio of 1, we have a significantly increased risk. And if the data is completely to the left of 1, we have a significantly decreased risk. So in terms of what's associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk, we can see that all of the different colored shapes, and there are three different colored shapes, which means that the these models were adjusted for demographics in red, for comorbidities in blue, and then other blood labs in green. So all of those different colored shapes, we can see that their 95% confidence interval, that's the horizontal line to the left and right of each shape, that completely is to the right of that hazard ratio of one, which means that when the RDW is greater than 13.7, that's significantly associated with an increased risk of death for all causes. 
In contrast, lowest risk of death for all causes for RDW is at relatively lower values, 11.4 to 12.5. As you can see that those different colored shapes are completely to the left of a hazard ratio of one, so associated with a lower risk of death for all causes. Now, there is one exception to these data, uh, and actually, before I go there, I should say the importance of relatively higher RDW being associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk is that the RDW increases during aging. And that, too, I've covered in an earlier video. And if you've missed it, I'll just mention, just mention in the comments and I'll point you to that video. Now, there is one exception to these data, and it's when the RDW values are less than 11.4, although this paper didn't specify how low below 11.4. As you can see that when the RDW percentile is 0.01 to 0.1, you can see that that's significantly associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. But just to put that into perspective, being in that RDW percentile range occurs at a frequency of 1 in 1,000 and 1 in 10,000 people would have an RDW value that low. In contrast, again, the RDW increases during aging with values greater than 13.7 being associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. So that's more likely to be found during aging. So these data in humans and in mice, when considering that they are similar, raises the question, can we maximize our lifespan? So translating the data from mice to humans, can we maximize our own lifespan by maintaining lymphocytes, RDW, but also why stop there? Why can't we have as many biomarkers as possible be as youthful as possible? Can we maximize lifespan by optimizing levels of these biomarkers at youthful levels? That's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you may be interested in, including Ulta Lab Tests, which is where I get the majority of my blood tests, epigenetic testing, NAD quantification, oral microbiome composition, at-home metabolomics, at-home blood testing with CyFox Health, which includes ApoB, but also the DNA methylation test GrimAge, green tea, diet tracking with coronometer, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, buy me a coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Die Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.